Hey everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Elias, and we're going to talk about the Kakao ZK VM today. Uh, I'm a software engineer, I'm 25, I'm French. I've been involved in crypto for over three years and uh, building on StockNet, leading Kakao with Clément. Uh, so I'm Clément, I'm a machine learning engineer. I've been in crypto for a year and a half, and so building Kakao for four months now, especially with Elias. Um, today we're going to go through why, in my opinion, ZK VMs are the scaling dream for Ethereum right now, how we have a competitive advantage in Cairo, our DNA, and our vision. First, maybe a bit of primer for those who don't know, the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, what it is. It's a distributed state machine where all the smart contracts and storage live in an Ethereum-like chain, so mainnet, uh, polygon, etc. It's a stack machine computer architecture, and for those who know, it differs from Kero in that uh, Kero is based on a Kero VM uh, registers. Here, it's a stack machine. So what are ZK VMs, really? They're EVMs in the sense that you can build in Solidity, Viper, Yule, deploy your smart contract, and in interact with it with the, normally the basic tooling, MetaMask, Hardhat, Foundry, uh, DApps, and the, the key difference is in, is in scaling, is in, is in gas cost and or uh, scaling performances. In layer one Ethereum, when you send a transaction, it's re-executed by every node in the network uh, to check its validity. Whereas in ZK context, in ZK rollups, you execute your transaction once, you generate a validity proof, and for the rest of the time, uh, it's going to be this is going to be validated. Of course, in, in, in rollups, this is simplified. In rollups, you batch a lot of transactions and you validate the, the state diff. So, why ZK EVMs, right? I know uh, Abdel, I know Louis retweeted this tweet. It's a, it's a bit of a hot take on ZK EVMs, the race to ZK EVMs. It's basically the say, the saying that why go to ZK EVMs when the ZK EVM was not built for ZK? So, you might as well build a very intelligently, uh, a very intelligent language such as Cairo, build a ZK VM without the E, and then you have a new DSL and new, a new community to build, but it's made for ZK. So why focus on solidity? It's still young, we can still change. My take is that you can keep the network effect of Ethereum and still conquer the innovative ZK scaling. I think there is some price to pay, which is performance. Right now, say, a native Cairo program will run at some speed and Kakarot will have some overhead, maybe 2x to 10x. So there is some price to pay, but right now we feel like Kero is, the, um, is accepted, is the new best language, but we have to remember we're in some kind of echo chamber and users are really lost. And in the recent years, the, the, the maximum they've gotten used to is MetaMask, some dApps, maybe Ave, Curve, uh, and not, not much more. So. It's a lot to, to ask to all the users and all the developers who know their basic uh, pipeline in uh, Ardat Foundry to switch. So I'm going now to give more details about exactly what's Kakarot today and how it works. So in this schema, you can see the, <coughs> the usual, I would say, uh, distinction between the Ethereum mainnet L1 at the bottom, uh, at the top, the StarkNet L2, Network. So this is the StarkNet as we all know, as we all use most probably. And on the left hand side you can see there is a user. So this might be you or Elise uh, Mother, if she's here, maybe. So the user, as you could expect from an EVM, wants to sign a transaction using, say, MetaMask or any of these wallets that he managed to install one day. So the, the role of Kakarot on its own, and first the role of the Kakarot RPC node, is to take this transaction signed with MetaMask and to sort of rewrite it a bit to send it to StarkNet. So this is something that you really have to understand and compared to some other people that talk about ZK EVM, we are a smart contract on StarkNet. So we have not built a blockchain yet. It might be required some days, but as of today, what we did is that we used Cairo as a language as we could have used any other language. You could have used Go, uh, Rust, to, to make a client. So what we, what we did actually is what people did when they, when they build GET or when they build RET. They use a language and they write an EVM interpreter. We did this, we used Cairo, and we put this interpreter on StarkNet in a smart contract. So at the end of the day, what happened is that when the user signed a transaction, we make a small 
translation, then we send it to the Starknet, uh, to the Starknet blockchain. And actually, it's interpreted by the, Star, uh, the, the Kakarot smart contract that will fetch, uh, say, the, the bytecode stored in other Starknet contract as in, uh, as in any other uh, Starknet uh, based uh, DAP. And then it will execute everything that needs to be executed and return the result uh, to the user. So it means that, you know, in a sense, all the, the applications that are deployed or, I mean, meant to be used with Kakarot, the application and StarkNet. Which means that all these applications that are deployed with Solidity, executed on StarkNet, they can communicate with all the applications that are built in Cairo and deployed in StarkNet as well. So it means that compared to a tool that you might be used to, like Warp, that helps only developers build on StarkNet because it converts the Solidity code into Cairo code that is eventually published to, to StarkNet. We let the user still use the MetaMask wallet that he's used to. The developers use Foundry or the tool they are used to. But we are still living in the same world. You know, we don't split uh, the TVL. We don't, we, we don't create a new small ecosystem. We are just here sort of to make this possible to use Solidity in StarkNet, but we still rely on StarkNet. And the truth is that we have a clear distinction between our role and the role from StarkWare. StarkWare has been creating the ZK context, which is the language Cairo and the, the StarkNet OS, and we have just been building the EVM using this context. And at the, at the intersection of the boss, there is, of course, this uh, amazing language, Cairo, that we use and, uh, and that we love. And there is not only a language, but there are also like, I would say in the beginning, two kinds of people that managed to merge as well to create this ecosystem, to, the Kakarot ecosystem. So we first had, uh, I think, Shah back in July that tweeted about the possibility to use, Shah is here, the possibility to use uh, his language, I mean, the language Cairo to build an EVM. And so people from Starkware, especially Abdel here, uh, the exploration team started to think about this and some other people in some other community led by only dust thought that, well, why not taking this change as well? It happened right before, I would say, Lisbon the Hackathon. And eventually from two teams, we realized that, man, why not making just one team? We, we may go further. So, of course, I would say that some of the people that were here at the very beginning, and especially the exploration team and in person Abdel, he was not alone, but especially Abdel, uh, has had uh, an important role, I would say, in structuring all these efforts and making the very beginning, uh, I would say, right decision about the structure. Uh, unfortunately, at some point, we, we have had to, for obvious security reason, uh, remove some of its work. So it happens. Huh? Abdel, no worries. Uh, so I have said... Uh, this is really, and this is not a joke, a community-driven effort. And it, we have been so far, I would say in three months, because lots of people have just joined the work and not meant to, to be on their own, but just be here. So we are now a team of more than, uh, I would say, uh, 30, 30 contributors. Uh, some, some companies are here on the right and the left because they give a, a stronger support, I would say, either uh, human support, financial support, it's just about grants and people that just come in and, and do a bit of development and they get funded, so they stay and they like the spirit. The, young, uh, the youngest, I think, um, contributor that we have is only 16 years old. Uh, he couldn't be here today because he had to, to work for high school. So it means that you are all welcome to just be here and try to do something and uh, I think that you will stay. Uh, this technical, I would not talk about this. So. Yeah, where we are today and what's next. So we are not on the sixth spot here. There is a problem, we are on the third, only the third. So starting out as a smart contract on StarkNet to build an MVP. This MVP is almost done, meaning that uh, right now we are on 70% uh, done on the RPC node. The EVM itself, the interpreter is deployed on testnet and works, uh, I would say, uh, perfectly. No, there is a... We <laughs> We miss, last words. <laughs> we, miss, we miss one precompile, the pairing precompile, and there uh, might be some bugs somewhere, of course. Uh, so then we will be able to make some end-to-end -end testing using MetaMax and stuff. 
This is the third, uh, the third dot where we are, some uh, in a month, maybe in a month and a half. And then there is this open question regarding uh, interoperability. Either we want to stay on StarkNet if it's reasonable in terms of overhead. And with the announcement that they made with the volition, uh, with the StarkNet 0.13, maybe with Caro 1.0, the, the overhead will be completely reasonable to stay like that. Maybe we will need to, to do it differently and to create an app chain or to move on to something like an L3. This is, these are completely open questions. Uh, we will discuss this question in the community call that we have, weekly community call. So again, feel free to join these calls. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think that if you have questions, uh, we are here now to answer this. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, there is a, so there is a deterministic mapping between an EVM address and, uh, uh, an, uh, um, and the counterpart in StarkNet. So each contract, being either uh, each account, say a contract account or an external end account, has its own counterpart as a StarkNet uh, smart contract. So uh, in the call opcode, depending on the address that you target, if it's uh, like uh, 160 bytes or if it's uh, uh, 251 by bits, not bytes, bits anyway, uh, you can know what type of contract you are trying to call. And we can also make this a bit easier as well, uh, writing, um, I would say, sort of a bridge, con not really a bridge, but a bridge contract, say in Solidity, so that for the developer it's easier with, a, uh, with the possibility to use the interface as you would do in Solidity. But once again, thanks of the addresses, then it's possible just in the call of code to make a small, small change. Oh uh, yeah, the question is, how is it possible to make this uh, uh, Solidity developed contract interact with a StarkNet contract, so Cairo based contract? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so no, the thing is, I love Cairo as well, so I would not say Cairo is not a good language for writing certain part. I think that you need to understand there is the developers, but there are also the users. So there is an ecosystem of tooling for the developers that you may still want to use. I mean, I love Cairo, but the tooling is not as good as the one that we have now in Solidity. So you may want to start with the tooling that you have that is a good one to go fast deploying some Solidity still on StarkNet, and then you know that with a good infrastructure, because you can still call normally StarkNet smart contracts, you can replace contract after contract, maybe with a, a, proxy, uh, a proxy pattern, some part of your smart contract to make it more efficient. And on the other end, there are also the users that may not you know, really be aware of the differences between the, the blockchain. So they want to keep the metamask that they have. They want to keep the address that they have. They don't want to like, say, okay, if it's on this chain, use this address, on this chain, use this other address, and so on and so forth. So, so on both ends, I think that it's, there is a business need, and the trade-off is less efficiency, a bit more cost, maybe, but it's maybe easier to start with. Yes, it would be about computation efficiency, so, so more extra, uh, a bit more costly, I think, for the user. Es but essentially, maybe we, um, we didn't address the fact that um, Cairo was built for ZK and the EVM is not built for ZK. So there is an um, inherent problem with ZK EVMs is that they are trying to make Solidity or e the EVM as an architecture fit into ZK. And so inherently there is a problem here because uh, Solidity and any other type of architecture was not meant for it. So we suffer from it and we have to find trade-offs to make it work. So this is why we talk about performance overhead and so on and so forth. And then I guess your question was like, m m why is Cairo better than <laughs> Solidity? I guess it's, it's good because it's built for ZK, it's more modern, it's, it has all the problems of Solidity that we've been fighting for five years, and then they leapfrog and they make it, you know, they learn from the mistakes. Solidity has the network effect and Keo has the, foot, the, the thought that has been accumulated, the experience in ZK, in opinionatedness, so on and so forth.
No more question. Someone? Well, thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure. It was fun.